Hey, what's up everyone and welcome to today's video. This video will guide you through the issues of the Uncanny X-Men published by Marvel in 1983. Issue 170. In a cabin, located in Rainier Falls in Alaska, music is playing and a certain couple is dancing. Madeline Pryor and Scott Summers are on their first date, after weeks of working together at Scott's grandparents' air cargo company. It's quickly becoming a lot more than a simple date, and neither of them is minding it one bit. Even though the music has stopped, they continue to hold each other tightly and dance, until Madeline mentions that they should probably restart the music. They've totally lost track of time and Scott notices the personnel already having left them behind. He's surprised they hadn't been kicked out. Madeline tells him the owner would never dare doing that, because Madeline had saved his son out of a plane crash last year. She continues by saying they could stay there all year and he wouldn't mention a thing if they did. And she asks Scott if he is tempted. He says he is and he suddenly realizes how crazy all this is. Madeline notices a change in his behavior and asks him what's going on, as his mind races with thoughts about how bad, but at the same time how good this feels. Madeline asks him to please talk to him, but all he can think about is getting out of there and leave Madeline behind as fast as he can. He looks at her as she's standing in front of the fireplace, as her silhouette surrounded by flames reminds him even more of his dead lover Jean Grey the Phoenix. Madeline, still confused about his change in behavior and asking if it's something she said or did, approaches him and tells him she's never felt like this ever before either. Scott tells her it's not because anything she's done, but somewhat has to do with her regardless. He tells her that there was once a woman, a woman called Jean Grey, and that they were in love and had planned to get married, but that she died before they could. He tells her he thought that it was done with dealing with the loss, putting all the griefs and joys he experienced with her behind him. He takes a picture out of his wallet and shows it to her, while telling her that he realized he wasn't done at all when he met her. Madeline is as confused at seeing her likeness on the picture almost as much as Scott was when he met her. She tells him that she figures this must be like a dream or a nightmare even, and then tells him that this will take her some time to get used to, by herself, as she hands him back the picture. And suddenly, where they were just growing so close moments before, closer than either one of them had expected, there's now a bottomless, unabridgeable abyss between them. Scott, rationally thinking that this is the best way to deal with this, to cause some pain first rather than have a lot of tragedy later on, is lost in thought, feeling that he might have just made a big mistake, that he might be ghost chasing, he should not be throwing his joy with Madeline out of the window like this. He knows for a fact that he won't learn anything by running away. He was so lost in thoughts that he didn't notice Madeline having come back. He asks her if maybe they can talk. She tells him that that's the exact reason she came back and she apologizes for startling him. He tells her it's fine and he tells her he likes her. A lot. She then asks if it's because of who she is or because of the way she looks. Scott says he doesn't know for sure but that he would like to find out. Madeline understands and asks him if he wants to start another dance because she just restarted the music. In New York, a thousand feet below the streets of Manhattan, Current and a former member of the X-Men have been taken prisoner by the Morlocks, who have been living in the tunnels here. Outcasts from society, not only because of their mutant powers, but also because of their often deformed looks. Their current members, Colossus, Storm, Nightcrawler and Sprite, came down here looking for their former teammate Angel. Angel had been kidnapped by the Morlocks, because their leader, Callisto, wants to marry this beautiful man, and the captured X-Men are being forced to watch the ceremony. Callista tauntingly asks Angel if he's looking forward to their wedding night as much as she is. This enrages Storm and yells out to Callista that Angel is not her plaything. She gets pulled back by her hair by Sunder, one of the Morlocks, and at that moment, Colossus and Nightcrawler explode into action. Kurt teleports out of his bindings and Pyotr changes into his metal form, becoming bigger and ripping the ropes apart that were binding him. Nightcrawler attacks Callisto and Colossus punches Sunder. Being in the tunnel now allows Storm to use more of her weather manipulating powers and she summons lightning, scattering the crowd of Morlocks around her. She realizes that the longer they stay there, the smaller their chances of escaping become. 
Nightcrawler is able to knock out Calisto by teleporting her multiple times in succession, which takes a lot out of her because she's not used to it. He teleports back to the altar, holding Callisto in the air, telling the Morlocks to release his friends and allow them to leave. Sunder asks Nightcrawler to please not hurt Callisto, and Storm tells him that they have hurt their demands. She hopes for the Morlocks to fall for Kurt's bluff, and realizes that there's still Kitty to find. They have no idea where she is, and no way to navigate in the maze of corridors below the ground. She wonders who or what these Morlocks are, and is amazed at Sunder being able to take blows from Colossus and still stand. Someone's hand is approaching Storm, which startles her, and the person the hand belongs to is telling her to not be afraid of a little old lady, because what can an old lady do? But this lady is no normal lady. It's Plague, and she's making Storm grow very sick very quickly. Storm falls to the ground, and Plague tells Nightcrawler her fever is temporary. Sick as a dog, but she will survive. But if Plague touches her again, she will die in agony. She tells him to give up now. Nightcrawler realizes he doesn't really have a choice and that retreating for help is not really an option either. He'd best stay here now, learn as much as he can about these Morlocks and hope for a chance to be able to help the others. Plague tells Colossus to stand down as well. Calissa tells Kurt he made a mistake in not killing her because when she's finished with him, he won't be able to go anywhere either. She tells him that if the roles were reversed, she wouldn't have hesitated for a second. Kurt asks Callisto who and what they are exactly, and if they're mutants like them. Callisto tells him that yes, they are mutants, but no, they are nothing like them. She tells him how rejected from society they've become, how this alley has become their home, and how they've come together. With the help of another mutant whose power allows him to sense other mutants, and his name is Caliban. Caliban himself has been looking after a very sick Kitty Pride, trying to get her fever down, but it doesn't seem to help any. Kitty feels like she's dying and asks Caliban to help her and the rest of the X-Men. But Caliban knows that if he does, she will leave him and never return. Kitty tells him that's not true and that she'll stay. She promises, but Caliban asks him how he could trust her. She tells him she gave her word and she swears that if he doesn't help, she will hate him for the rest of her life. She asks him if that is what he wants. Caliban doesn't notice Kitty passing out from the strain as he's trying to figure out what to do with his dilemma. To help Kitty or defy Callisto. Somewhere else, on a hunting ground, riders on horses are following wolfhounds which are on the trail of their prey. The location is England and the year is 1783, but their prey is a woman who won't be born for several years. The prey is Mystique and she has no idea how she got here. All she is concerned with now is that she has to run for her life. The last thing she remembers is that she was in the bed in her house, but this feels way too real to be a dream. As she's running, she trips and stumbles into a stream of water. The hounds caught up to her and they start tearing at her clothes and flesh. One of the female riders on a horse called Satan calls for Sir Jason to get the dogs in line. Jason pulls the dogs off, picks up Mystique and hands the rider a knife to perform the coup de grace. The red-haired lady, dressed in red and white, thanks him and grabs the knife. Mystique looks scared as Lady Jean Grey slashes her throat, at which moment Mystique wakes up from a terrifying nightmare, sitting up straight while screaming and realizing that she's still alive. Analyzing the nightmare, she recognizes both the man and the woman, namely Jason Weingart of the Inner Circle of the Hellfire Club and Jean Grey, the Phoenix of the X-Men, one who is dead and the other being in a catatonic state in a mental institution. She gets out of bed and notices her ankle, which she had broken in the dream, is sore in reality. She figures that the nightmare was anything but an ordinary dream, and that someone must have been putting it in her mind. As she makes her way downstairs, Irene Adler, also known as the Precognitive Mutant Destiny, is sitting in the kitchen. She prepared a pot of fresh coffee, knowing that Raven would be awake and agitated. Raven says it's a pity Irene wasn't able to anticipate the nightmare or the cause of it. But Irene tells her her power should have picked it up, but something, some force, is causing a disturbance preventing her to see the possible paths of the future. Raven wonders if Charles Xavier could be at the source of all of this, but Irene doubts that even the strongest telepath on Earth is possible of this kind of trickery. Suddenly Irene has a precognitive flash and it concerns Rogue, Raven's foster child. She appears to be in some form of danger. Raven is about to make her way up to Rogue's room upstairs, but Irene tells her that it's already too late. 
Rogue had recently been on a vendetta against a mutant performer Dazzler, and Raven knew that it was a bad idea and shouldn't have been allowed to pursue that. Entering Rogue's room, Raven notices her room being empty, just as Irene had foretold. Her clothes are gone, and Rogue hadn't left a note either. Irene is unable to clearly see her future, and Raven figures that this is as deliberate as the nightmare she experienced. She wonders who is taunting them like this. At that very moment, we see Rogue on the bus, departing from Washington, looking out of the window, feeling miserably and wondering what's moving her to run away from her home and the people she loves. And again, someone somewhere is laughing, mockingly and in a malevolent and triumphant manner. Down in the Morlock Tunnel, deep below New York City, Kalissa tells the captive X-Men that they should be smiling and enjoying the festivities. She suggests Mask to cheer them up. Mask approaches Storm and touches her face. The skin on her face starts to stick to Mask's fingertips as he transforms Storm's face. Nightcrawler sees this with a perplexed look on his face, then grows angry and tells Mask to stop this, telling him that Storm is not a toy to be played with, but a human being who deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Mask then turns towards him and takes off his hood, revealing his own disfigured face and asks Nightcrawler how much dignity and respect he himself deserves. He can reshape any face or body, except his own, and asks Kurt if he can figure out why he hates what's pretty, as he moves his hand towards Kurt's face. Kalissa tells Mask to leave Nightcrawler alone, telling him she was thinking of having Mask turn him inside out, but she changed her mind. She likes his courage and figures that with his looks, he's as much as an outcast as they are and invites him to join them instead. Kurt tells Kalissa that he will not desert his friends, besides the fact that he spent all his life fighting to be accepted as he is. To not be judged by his looks, but by his deeds instead. All of them are then startled by the arrival of Kellerman. He is carrying Sprite, who is on the verge of dying. He's begging Kalissa to save her. Seeing this, Anger's Colossus to the point where he armors up and he breaks the metal chains that were keeping him captive and he tells them that if Kitty does indeed die, he will bring this tunnel down on them all. Kurt, who teleported next to Caliban, tells him to let him take a look at her since he has medical training. He asks him if they have a healer amongst them. Caliban tells him that they do have one that heals broken bones and his wounds, but not one that is able to cure the sickness that plague brings. Kurt wants to get Kitty back to the mansion as soon as possible, since they have advanced medical facilities there. But Kalissa tells him that they are not going anywhere, and if he wants his friends to stay healthy, he will stay here, until Kalissa tells him differently. And if the brat dies, she dies. Caliban then informs Nightcrawler that the only way to overrule Kalissa is to remove her as leader of the Morlocks, something which can only be done through trial by combat. Something Kurt is willing to do, if that's the only way of saving Kitty. Nightcrawler challenges Kalissa, who then tells him that this will be a battle to the death. A minor detail that Caliban forgot to mention. Storm then, even though she's extremely sick, steps in as the leader of the X-Men and challenges Callisto instead, telling her that the duel and her life are hers to take. Kurt asks Storm if she's lost her mind. She is in no shape to fight and Kitty's life is at stake. But Aurora tells him that she is as adamant as Callisto is, taunting Callisto as she says that. Callisto is up for the challenge and tells Nightcrawler not to worry. Once Callisto has dealt the finishing blow to Storm, it'll be his turn. The arena is set and Callisto makes sure Storm understands not to use any of her mutant powers or Kitty's throat will be cut out. Storm says she understands. Callisto throws Storm's knife through the air, looping it and twisting it around. But Storm, with a stoic look on her face, angry even, stares straight at her and effortlessly plucks the knife out of the air. This bluff strikes Callisto and Colossus both, but Nightcrawler is recognizing it as bluff, knowing that Storm is vowed to never take a life, and if Callisto realizes this, Storm is done. The duel has started and Callisto is a born huntress, rivaling Wolverine's fighting prowess, and she enjoys fighting. She draws first blood and laughs at Storm's clumsiness. She tells Storm that she's making this way too easy, and Storm responds by saying that she talks too much, as she tricks Callisto by wrapping her cape around Callisto's right arm. She pulls Callisto's arm in hand, holding the knife, up in the air, making them stand closer to one another as she stabs her right in her heart. Callisto then drops to the ground and Storm walks away from her body. She walks up to the altar and takes Angel down, carrying him in her arms. She tells Colossus to take Kitty and addresses the rest of the Morlocks, telling them that if any of them has an objection, they are welcome to challenge her and rest the same fate as Callisto's. 
She tells them that she is now their leader and there's no need for them to keep hiding in the tunnel. There is a home and a sanctuary for them at Xavier's. Caliban responds by telling her that he knows her words are true, but they belong down here. He continues by saying that he hopes that from this day forward, the Morlocks and the X-Men can live in peace and will continue as friends. Storm asks Nightcrawler about Callisto and he tells her that she is alive, thanks to the healer. But if he hadn't been there, she would have surely died. Kurt asks Storm if stabbing Callisto in her heart was her intent, and Storm confirms. Kurt says he never expected that of her, and Storm responds by saying that neither did Callisto, and that was her mistake. At dawn, in Alaska, Scott and Madeline both wake up on the couch. They've been enjoying each other's presence until deep in the night. Scott says he's hungry and Madeline tells him she will make some breakfast for him. She suggests something which just happens to be Scott's favorite breakfast. He then asks her how she knew and she jokingly tells him that she's a mind reader. She's being blinded by the sun coming up and is about to take Scott's glasses off his face, asking him if he minds her borrowing them. Scott instinctively hits her arm, stands up and yells to her to not touch them. Madeline has no idea what's going on and asks him what that was all about and why he hit her. Scott apologizes, but Madeline says that that's not good enough. She wants a straight answer this time, asking him why she's never seen him without his glasses, whether it's day or nighttime. Scott is having a dilemma, wondering if he could trust her telling her that he's a mutant, figuring that the smart thing to do would probably be to lie to her. After a couple of seconds, he grabs a coin out of his pocket, flicks it in the air, takes off his glasses for a second and punches a hole right through the coin with his eye beam. As he catches the coin, he tells her he's a mutant, telling her the strength of his powers. Madeline says that she's impressed, but he tells her not to be. He then tells her that he can't control his powers, always needs to be on his guard and needs the glasses to keep the beams in check. She understands the risk and responsibilities involved, and it's a relief for Scott to have found someone who does. She mentions that she is aware of mutants and how they are being seen by the general populace and asks him why he told her a secret. He tells her he did because she asked and because he can't or doesn't want to lie to her about anything. He tells her he would understand if she wants him to leave now. She then tells him that if the time will ever come, she will let him know, but she wants him to please stay for now. He responds to her by saying it's his pleasure to do so and she says she's glad to hear that. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, because that will help me out in growing this channel and being able to produce more videos like this one. See you next episode.